Jesus, I'm gonna die. Oh, damn, I'm already way over the speed limit. I'm Russell Darnell with ExplorerForum.com and this is our first drive of the 2025 Ford Explorer. This unit has been mid-cycle refreshed off the sixth generation platform for the 25 model year. The very first thing you're gonna notice is the bold front new grille. Ford redesigned the headlights, bolder grille up front, new fog lamps, new lower fascia, and new hood up here on top. This here is the Platinum Edition. Now Ford has streamlined their trims. You no longer have XLT, Limited, Hybrid, Platinum, ST. You have four trims. You have Active, which replaces the XLT. You have ST, you have Platinum, and you have also ST Line, which is an appearance package of the Active. It gives you the outside look of an ST with the non-ST performance. And Ford has told us that a lot of people like the way an ST looks, but don't necessarily need all that ST power. Now Ford does have several new wheel options available. This is a carryover 21 inch from the old Platinum. Still looks wonderful, it's this brush finish. Uh, you also got two other wheel options uh, with the Platinum, both 20 inches. You have a nickel uh, finish and a satin finish. They look amazing on the Platinum. We come around to the back here. Ford has also updated the tail light design with this cross through uh, light bar now with a, a raised Explorer font on it. We just got back from a test drive, so a little dirty. New lower fascia on, our, uh, on the rear bumper, chrome tipped ex or chrome exhaust tips, and all Explorers now come standard with a 5,000 pound towing capacity with the seven pin trailer tow. Unfortunately, integrated trailer brake controller is still not available. We asked them about that. They found that most people don't tow something with trailer brakes on their Explorers, but they still like to tow with them. So you do have the seven pin if you want to go ahead and add your own trailer brake controller. That'd be a nice little mod uh, write up for EF. So kudos to you. Come back around here to the side. None of the belt line, shoulder lines, roof line, none of that's changed. Now on the ST and ST line, you do now have the option, and we'll see those models here in a little bit, we'll have the option of a blacked out roof up top. Ford found that a lot of people were taking those and wrapping them and kind of screwing up the belt lines and shoulder lines a little bit, but Ford has now given you the option of having a blacked out roof with a warranty. Now this model, the Platinum has the upgraded Mojave Dusk interior. This interior looks stunning as I get dirt all over it. This interior, it's like a brown purple color, but in person, this thing really pops. This color just looks amazing. They took inspiration from a sunset in the Mojave Desert, and that's how you get this theme. And the, the pleated leather feels wonderful. The, the wood appliques look amazing. And of course, you'll see in our first drive, you know, I was talking about the materials, but the leather feels great. On the Platinums, you do have a couple of different seating options. Uh, whereas before, when you got a Platinum, it was fully loaded. You got what you got. Now you have the option of what this model has, this upgraded seating surface with only captain's rear seats. You cannot get a bench seat with the pleated leather. 
Not sure why, but it's a more of a streamlined thing that Ford is doing. Uh, on the lower seating package with the Platinum, you can get a bench seat. So if you like those bench seats, like a certain Chris Kilbo that I know, you can get them, just not with the pleated surfaces. Another change for the 25 model year is now on Platinums, like this example, you can get the 2.3. Now this example does have the three liter, but before Platinums, you got the three liter, that was standard. You got all wheel drive, that was standard. Now with Platinums, you can get a two three if you like. You can get a three liter if you like. You can get it in rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. So Ford has pretty much merged the Limiteds and the Platinums together to give you that little bit of an option list with the Platinums. Cause some folks didn't want to get a fully loaded Platinum. They wanted the nice luxurious part of it, but they didn't necessarily need all wheel drive or they didn't necessarily need the three liter. So you do have those options. Now the 2.3 has been reworked for the 25 model year. They've essentially pulled it out of the Mustang and put it in the Explorer with some retweaking of the transmission. The 2.3 does come standard with 300 horsepower and the three liter comes standard on both ST and Platinum with 400 horsepower. It wasn't like 20 and 21 where you got a Platinum with 365 horsepower and the ST was 400. It's pretty much the same across the board. My name is Chris Gilbo. I'm here with Russell Darnell. We are from the Explorer Forum. We are driving the 2025 Ford Explorer. We just decided to pick a 25 Platinum 3 liter EcoBoost. And I have it in sport mode right now. And this thing is definitely got some power. Jesus, I'm gonna die. Oh, damn, well, already way over the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> the exhaust sounds louder and not in a bad way. It sounds like they've retuned the exhaust. Everything seems really soft. It's comfortable. It's easy to control. I have all my switch gear and very easy spots to use. And this, uh, this Explorer definitely has a very comfortable ride to it. It seems a little smoother, maybe a little bit more refined, but overall it's it's very similar to what it felt like beforehand. Right. I don't think you're getting a huge dry, change in driving experience from the previous uh, model year. And you know, sitting here in the passenger seat, I've got a good vantage on, on a lot of touch points. And with this Platinum model that we're in, you know, the first thing I notice is this kind of burled wood uh, or simulated burled wood uh, applique here on the dash that runs almost coast to coast. And it feels very nice. It has a little bit of a sound to it. I don't know if you can hear that, but it does feel nice visually. It's very appealing. Visually, it, it doesn't look like it's just a, a same pattern repeating over and over again. And you see that same applique carry over here onto the door panel. Now with this Platinum, we are actually in the top tier Platinum. Uh, and what I mean by that is the, the seating, the leather seating surfaces. This is the Mojave Dusk interior uh, with the upgraded uh, kind of quality or leather that they have and you have this nice quilted stitched leather, not only on the door panels, but also on the seat backs. And it feels nice. I mean, you rub your hand on it. It doesn't just feel like slick, cold leather. This actually has a nice, feel to it and that leather's kind of continued up here uh, over the quilted pattern and on the armrest the armrest at least sitting in the passenger seat the armrest on both the uh, inboard and outboard feel very nice i i do like the the, the armrest positions of the explorer and I remember this from owning a 21 Explorer, that everything's set really well and your arms are in a good spot. You don't feel awkward sitting in this. You, you're, you're, you feel like you're in a living room or in a recliner. You're not s sitting on the truck, you're sitting in the truck and feels comfortable. And you know, I don't know if Ford did actually change the cushioning or the actual seat structure or architecture. But again, from what I remember of the Platinum that we own, the 21, this 25, these seats do feel a little bit more comfortable. They've got uh, a little bit more bolstering in the appropriate areas of your lower back. 
it feels like they hug your rib cage just a tiny bit more but again this could just be that they could be identical and i'm just feeling something different but it does feel different now talking about the soft touch points the center console here with the leather wrapped on the sides I cannot tell you as a tall person how much I appreciate that when your knees are hitting the console all the time and you actually got a nice soft dirt uh, surface to actually feel that against. So the dash with all the different textures and feel and the, the different materials that they've used here, at least in the Platinum model, look very nice and they actually flow well, very well together. Right, I, I have to agree. But yeah, the only thing I can see is a, the, a little bit of piano black. It's gonna show dirt, dirt and dust. And like fingerprints, fingerprint, fingerprint, fingerprint. And I understand why automakers are going with the piano black. Visually, it looks very nice, but it looks, it only looks nice when it's very, very clean. Right. When it gets smudged up and you start putting drinks in here and, and you know, little, it's gonna show smudges. Well, over time, yeah, and then also after a little while of time too with Piano Black, you start seeing the that little almost like uh, swirl marks that happen on it over time. Mm -hmm. This Piano Black might be only applicable to the Platinum. I believe if you have the ActiveX, this is more of a kind of a, a plastic, non-Piano Black texture. Right. So this might just be a Platinum only, but we, we can look at other ones. But I do have a gripe on the Platinum though. Okay. It's the top of the dash. It looks cheap. It looks almost too cheap. Now, um, it looks more like a standard Explorer. It, the previous Platinum had the leather wrap dash. It just looked more elegant and looked nicer. Um, that's just my personal gripe. I think this top part of the dash kind of looks a little cheap. I mean, it's, it's a gripe of mine, but having, the, having come from a, a Platinum, that's the only thing I see is kind of a a, a knock on the, the interior style. And, and the previous iteration, I believe the Platinum's had that leather wrapped or maybe even simulated stitch leather up here on the top. It was, it was actually it was actually genuine leather. Because okay. I, I remember they actually had said in somewhere that you could actually, it, it's like 89 square feet of genuine leather was in the Platinum. Mm. And I think they've kind of reduced that genuine leather uh, quantity down a little bit. Although I do feel a less. that here in the, in the new iteration of the 2025 Explorer, in order for them to streamline, that's something that Ford has been talking a lot about about this, streamlining the, uh, the building process, this is probably why you've got Ford rubber up on the top of the dash. Right, and you only have 28 configurations of the Explorer now versus the 60 plus that they had before with the uh, 24 and older model year. Right. So now in the Platinum, also you have the ability to do the three liter, or you have the two three. You don't have to get the three liter in the Platinum. And also, it, the Platinum is also available in two wheel drive, where it was not available in two wheel drive before. You, when you got the Platinum, you got the three liter with the four wheel drive. That was just what it was. Now you have a little bit more options when you're getting a Platinum. You can get like either a lower tier Platinum or a higher tier Platinum because there is no XLT anymore. It's replaced with active. Our test example here today is a three liter rear wheel drive. So we don't even have the all wheel drive right. on this particular unit. But again, this beautiful Mojave dusk interior. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but this color absolutely looks stunning. It's it's a, a brown purple, but it's not an offensive purple. This is a wonderful, wonderful color. Right, it was inspired by the sunsets of the Mojave Desert. That's how they got that, that nice purple hue to come out in, in this beautiful leather. It, mainly, this thing is a refresh with some really good tech upgrades. And, you know, the vehicle is now going to have Blue Cruise. But, yeah, this is, it really hasn't changed. It's, so, the way it feels, the way it steers, there's really no update into as, as far as the ride quality goes, in my opinion. Uh, the only thing I see different as far as, like, 
ride quality is the MVH is down, which I appreciate because I know that mm, the 21 that I used to drive regularly, uh, it was it rattled a lot. It had a lot of little MVH issues. How do you feel about it as as riding it as a passenger? You know, as, sitting it, in the passenger seat, it definitely feels very planted. It, it's soaking up the road bumps here in North, in Michigan uh, uh, very well. Uh, we're going through a little bit of a residential area, so you know there is a, some potholes here and there, and it feels very planted. It feels very secure. I feel isolated from the rest of the road, but I felt that way in the 21. You know, it felt very much the same. I will agree with you that. NVH seems to be improved. That is a huge, huge deal for me. Having better NVH qualities, uh, noise, vibration, harshness, uh, improvements in those areas is huge for consumers because that's the number one thing that, you, or that's the first thing you're gonna notice on a brand new car is uh, not necessarily a flaw in the paint or something, but if you're driving a, a $55,000, $60,000 vehicle and the first thing you hear is a squeak when going over a bump, you're gonna be a little irritated. So it does feel like Ford took a lot of good time or a lot of time to improve those NVH qualities of this new 2025 model. Right, I, I definitely agree with that because the, the, as I said, when I was driving the earlier 20 to 24 model years, it just seemed like that was too much NVH. And I think they finally took some hints that this was a problem and they not got a lot of that correct, corrected. And you know, with the launch of the 2025, Ford is taking their time. I know some folks are getting a little panicky, well, not panicky. I know some folks are starting to get a little uh, upset that they haven't hit dealers yet, but Ford is taking the, uh, the quality of the next generation mid-cycle refresh of the Explorer uh, seriously, and they're holding on to them for quality purposes. They want these vehicles, when they hit the, the dealer lots as a redesigned vehicle, they don't want quality problems. No one does. But they are taking their time to do that. And they understand the rush. They understand that consumers are wanting these vehicles. And Ford, I do feel, after talking with some of the engineers and whatnot, I do feel that Ford is genuinely wanting these out to, to customers hands but they don't want to have quality problems we don't want a, re a rehash of the 2020 launch right every single marketing person that we talked to uh, over this trip has literally said the reason why they haven't shipped yet is just because they want them to be ready and they're not going to ship a vehicle if it's not 100% ready. They do not want an issue. They do not want quality control issues. And that's also part of the reasons why they consolidate a lot of the features of the Explorer. So yeah, they, they had all these different options that look like they work together on paper, but when they combined certain combinations, things didn't work out. So that was one of the reasons why they streamlined the Explorer and also made it a little bit more yeah, easy for them to get it out and get it right the first time. So one of the cool things about the 25 Explorer is they put some Easter eggs around the Explorer. Uh, a couple things like skylines, like they did the Chicago skyline and the uh, Michigan, uh, Detroit, Michigan skyline on the other side. Something else that they did is they did an Easter egg on the passenger side of the console where you have the different generations of the Explorer. It's starting off from a first generation all the way into the sixth generation Explorer. Uh, the cool thing is on the first generation Explorer, they use a Jurassic Park Explorer uh, silhouette. So it has literally the Jurassic Park Explorer in the silhouette on the uh, passenger side of the console. And for a lot of people, the Explorer has evolved as they have evolved as well. So, you know, I've started, I cut my teeth on the first generation Explorer and now I'm driving a sixth generation 25 model year. And, you know, the Explorer has been a part of my life for years. And this is what's, it's come for the full circle that I'm now kind of part of the new Explorer launch. It's kind of fun.
Yeah. What do you think? And you know, I agree. When the Explorer first launched in 1990 as a 1991 model, uh, it was a game changer. It gave you that kind of rugged, go anywhere, do anything look while still being very uh, comfortable on the inside. You know, I think at the time, folks called it like driving a taller, wider Taurus. You know, it wasn't the rough and tumble Jeep Cherokee or even the old internationals or anything like that. It was actually a comfortable vehicle to drive. And so people flocked to it from the, on the first generation from 91 to 94. Over 1.2 million Explorers were built in just those four years, not counting Mazda Navajos, which in 1991, the Mazda Navajo, Mazda's variant of the two-door Explorer, won Motor Trend Truck of the Year. So the Explorer for 35 years, Explorer has been around for 35 years now. Uh, you know, it's kept its goal of go anywhere, do anything. Granted, that's kind of, it's ebbed and flowed over the generations. You know, we all know the fifth gen, but you know what? Fifth gen, even though it was front wheel drive based, that was a, it was a sign of the times. And it was either share some platforms with the Taurus or kill the Explorer name. So I think that was a necessary sacrifice that had to be made in order to keep the Explorer name played alive. And I fully, fully agree with what Ford did there. And then of course you went back to your rear wheel drive routes with the sixth generation Explorer for 2020. And then of course this 25 Explorer is just a continuation, an evolution of that philosophy. And this really does feel like a go anywhere, do anything type of vehicle for the 21st century. And I know that sounds right. cliche, but I do feel it's true. I mean, it I agree with that to a point. I think that it does have a little bit of loss of its rugged off-roadiness. Yes, that is hands down understood. I know a lot of people are gonna say that it's, it's got this lost its, its off-road roots. But, you know, we're gonna be off-roading one of these here in a little bit today. Um, so I'm interested to see how it's gonna perform off-road. But again, it is, it's not meant to be this rugged off-road vehicle. Even back in the 90s when they came out, that's not what Ford's demographic was going for. They were going for that family that was trying to not have a minivan. They wanted to still have that, that young, youthful look uh, of having you know, that rugged outdoorsiness, but still be able to haul their kids to soccer practice. And when I was growing up, that's what an Explorer was. It was the soccer mom vehicle too. It was, but you know, dad could drive it and feel like he had this rugged vehicle and then mom could drive it to the soccer practice to pick up the kids. I did have a couple questions from people from the forum asking a few things. Okay. Um, one of the things was the Timberline returning. We're not getting any information yet on that. No. We, we do speculate it's coming back, but as far as knowing for sure if the Timberline trim level is gonna continue, as of right now, there is no confirmation and they're being very tight-lipped on that. Yes, Timberline, it, <laughs> It will be coming. They're just not confirming that it's coming. Right. Um, but yes, Timberline, we're gonna see it. We're not seeing it on this uh, first drive event. It will come out later, I'm sure. Now this is of course just me and Chris saying this. Ford has not confirmed or denied anything with Timberline, but it's coming. Right, and I did wink, see wink. another, I did see another somebody's message saying, hey, will I have the three liter this time around? And I mentioned that to them too. I said, hey, you know, if you do bring out the Timberline or some off-roady version, three liter in the Timberline or off-roady version, we, we would like to see that. So, um, so yeah, we, we mentioned that too. The other thing that I was asked about was subscriptions. As far as I know, the only thing subscription based on this vehicle is gonna be Blue Cruise. 
That's the only thing that's gonna have a subscription. That's Ford specific. So a little bit more in detail on the subscription thing. Yes, Blue Cruise is gonna be subscription based. The other things that are subscription is just your normal things. That's gonna be your XM radio, that sort of. Now, I do believe my Corsair is this way and I think Ford's going this way, maps. Because everyone has been using Google Play or uh, Android Auto and, and uh, Apple CarPlay, the map function that's inherent to at least Sync 4 is subscription based. However, this map system that's based on the Android Automotive platform, remember Android Automotive and Android Auto are two kind of different things within the Android uh, umbrella. I'm not sure if this is subscription based or not. Uh, I will put something in the video to confirm that when you see this, but uh, yes, really the big thing is gonna be Blue Cruise. That is the big subscription thing. It's not gonna be like a certain German car company that wanted to charge monthly for heated seats. Ford does not feel that they need to go that route at this time. The driving position, you've got several different driving positions. This isn't like the Aviator's 30,000 way seats, but it's not hard to find a comfortable seating position in this vehicle. I'm a tall guy, I'm 5'11", I'm built pretty sturdy, and I feel comfortable sitting in this vehicle. This, I, I have a good line of sight on the road. Uh, I can see my, my quarter points, the, the power bulge and the hood is there, but it doesn't really impede your vision. Uh, the vehicle, again, feels very stable. Um, obviously, this has Blue Cruise not on these little side roads, but even just driving along where you're in control of it, uh, it feels very planted, it feels very secure, and it is soaking up road bumps very, very well. Steering feel, it, it's, it's, on, it's on center. It's not as lively as, say, a Mustang, but it's not as dead as, like, uh, I don't know, a Hyundai electric car, right? This has good steering feel. You don't get a lot of feedback from the road. That's just inherent with the E-Pass system, the electric power steering system, but I think Ford has tuned this steering system very well considering it is electric. And I don't think you'd be disappointed in it. Now, even in eco mode that we're driving in, this, this three liter has plenty of power. But this one has fairly good engine tone too. I love the way the engine sounds on this three liter. It's just a good sounding engine. And you know, Ford was telling us that while the three liter and the 10R80 transmission haven't really been revised that much, they are pretty much carryover. The 2.3 has been revised and they are telling us essentially it is the exact same power plant from the Mustang 2.3. And now you could say, well, yeah, they're the same motor, but Ford has actually done the tuning and everything on it where it's a lot more in line with the calibration of a 2.3 Mustang as well. So I am actually kind of interested in driving one today to, feel, to see what it feels like. They did also update the shift points of the 10 R80. Uh, so it does shift a little bit better. So yes. for a 10 speed automatic, they are making improvements to it as they're going along. Yes. So, uh, they've learned from some of their mistakes and they've improved on them. So, so kudos for Ford on that. At least they're taking the feedback uh, on these vehicles. And that's the one thing I can definitely say about the the people that we've met from Ford Motor Company is they're listening to the owners. They're saying, hey, what do you not like about your Explorer? What do you not like about your vehicle? What do you not like about it? And then what do you like about it? And then expanding on those things and making them better. So I can definitely see where they're taking uh, consumer feedback and saying, hey, this is, what the buyers are saying that they want or what they don't want and proving on it. Yeah, Ford is doing very well in listening to customer feedback as well as enthusiast, uh, enthusiast feedback. They are taking all of that into consideration. I mean, shoot, they brought us out here twice already just to, for this particular model. Just making sure that we're, that they're getting it right and you know taking care of their consumers and saying, hey, making sure that they like what they're getting.
right now I've got it in sport mode and this thing takes off. It just wants to go. It just wants to go. Those, those the, the, the gears hold longer, it downshifts quicker. I feel like the ratios, well, the ratios obviously don't change, but how quick it shifts is, is the, uh, just, it. you have to drive one. But no, this is a, it's a market improvement. Like I said, it's a more of a evolution than revolution, but it's improving in the areas that it definitely needed to improve in. And interior quality has improved, interior design has improved, the materials have improved. This center armrest is very comfortable. Yeah. As is the, uh, even the outboard armrest on the driver's side. Very I do feel like the seating positions are very comfortable. They are. They, it, it feels comfortable to ride in it. You're not feeling like you're riding on top of it or right. you're feeling like you're riding, you know, in a bathtub or something like that. Exactly. And I know like the uh, fifth generation Explorer, it basically uh, just- That's something, yes. It the, felt like you were sitting in a bathtub the whole time. It really did feel like you were sitting in a bathtub. The door panels were so far outboard that you had to like lean over to even use the armrest, at least to me it did. And that has, I mean, of course that was improved with the 2020 model, but this overall, I'm very happy with how Ford has updated this vehicle, made it just a little bit better, a little bit more accommodating for a few more people, especially with the digital experience. I think this is gonna be a great buy uh, for those looking for that midsize three row SUV that is also fairly capable and you know in other avenues i said last night to the, some of the ford engineers that you know the the current uh, 20 to 24 explorer it's good in many areas great in a couple lacking in a couple and while this 2025 doesn't necessarily raise the bar across the board it has made it just a little bit better, better in those areas that it was really, really good at. Mm -hmm. I, I can agree with that. Yeah, it's it's definitely a little bit more refined in most places. It's streamlined a little bit more. It again, I I think that it's it's a good fit for a lot of people. I, again, it's a little big for a probably for just a single person. You know, if you're just your standard single person, it might be a little bit big for you. But this particular vehicle, I mean, it could be fine for a single person. They wanna have something a little bit bigger that they can drive around and feel comfortable in. It's not hard to drive. It's easy to maneuver. It's easy to take places. And if you decided to go on a road trip, it'd be perfect for it. And, you know, it has towing capabilities, which is nice too. The the one thing that you and I have complained about, obviously, is the lack of trailer brake controlling. But the engineers are telling us that it doesn't need it because majority of the people that are towing with these are not towing heavy things that require trailer brakes. They have their F-150 for that. They use this for their light towing things, their small utility trailer. As we're going down this little dirt road. As we turn off the paved road. Onto a little dirt road that's just rough and tumble type road. It feels very nice. You really don't even tell that we're on a dirt road. Yeah. I mean, it's quiet. The loose gravel is nothing for this thing. All right, we are in the 2025 Ford Explorer Active with 2.3 liter four wheel drive. We are going to be going on the little off-road course they have set up here. So the little bunny slope. The little bunny slopes, yeah. <laughs> but we're gonna have a little bit of fun. We are gonna have a little bit of fun. So they were touting the Explorer as they've designed it to go off-road in the sense of what 95 percentile of Explorer owners would potentially 
use their truck off-road for. So this is not meant to emulate off-roading on Golden Spike or top of the world in Moab, right? This is for owners that want to go up to their cabin up in the woods and may have some uh, dirt roads or some ruts that they need to go on. So of course, we're once we get over there, we're going to be putting it in an off-road mode. And actually, we can go ahead and <coughs> do that now. We are now in off-road. This is going to change the shift points, how the throttle actuates. It obviously attenuates different software calibrations within the ABS module, the uh, transfer case control module, that sort of thing. So already I could tell that it is holding the gears much higher and much longer. So for example, I'm pretty sure I'm in second gear and at 3000 RPM in off-road mode. Now granted, we're just going down a little simple dirt road. Here we go on the off-road course, which is, uh, for Explorer form, this is just a little uh, gravel road. <laughs> but even then, it's handling the gravel fairly well. The vehicle still feels fairly planted. Yeah. And again, in off-road mode, it disables traction control and holds your gears longer, uh, lower gears anyway. Thumbs up from uh, ST. Here we go. Now we're starting to get into there some. There we go. Oh yeah, this uh, this active uh, active trim with four wheel drive is really handling this course very well. Getting a little bit of a mud sling here or a little rut. Went through it, no problem. Oh yeah, this is. This is definitely not what you would think you would take your brand new, you know, $40,000 Explorer on, but it can absolutely handle it. We're going to do a little bit of a turn here. You feel the you feel the all-wheel drive starting to kind of kick in on certain corners, which is once what what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, it hand, it handles this like a breeze. Oh, and you just whip this thing around in this. I mean, you I, the turning radius is great. I'm actually kind of shocked at how well this uh, this is going here. I, I mean, mean these are I, tight turns. Right, and, the, and it, obviously this is a predetermined course. Oh, it's, it's got a little brand new Super Duty sitting over there. I'm Russell Darnell with Explorer Form. We're out here at the American Mobility Center out in uh, near Detroit, Michigan. And I have the pleasure of speaking with, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, Andrew Staley, I'm one of the Explorer Marketing Managers. And so what is your job exactly with the Explorer program? So as a product marketing manager, I'm working on future products, right? So think 26, seven, eight, nine, 30 model years. Um, so future development, bringing in features, uh, going through that business case, uh, uh, things like that. Okay, so what what kind of influence or what were some of your responsibilities for the 2025 Explorer up yeah. to this point? No, certainly. Uh, a lot of it was customer research, right? Listening to what customers wanted most, what what features are missing, what things they want improved, what things they really liked, right? And and a lot of that was really loved the foundation that it was built on. Uh, the CD6 platform, super capable. The driving dynamics are phenomenal. Um, and then we spent a lot of energy on the interior and the technology. Um, and that all came out through customer research. What would you say the, the number one feedback that you got from your customers regarding the, the new 2025 that you implemented into this current model? Yeah, I mean, I'll take the interior example. We get, That came up numerous times of, hey, we're spending a lot of time in our vehicles. We need a space of, of rejuvenation. This is my sanctuary from the chaos of my daily life, right? So really elevating that and bringing connectivity inside of their vehicle. So it's like a, a mobile office, a mobile living room, a place where where they can rejuvenate a little bit. And I think we've done just that with the 25. What would, what's your favorite part of the 25? What the change Ooh. there? Yeah, there's a bunch. Um, I mean, the big screens, right? Standard 13.2 inch screens, the 12.3 inch digital cluster. Uh, between those two things and how the technology is playing into them. So the Ford digital experience that's powering those two screens. And of course, Ford, uh, the hands-free highway driving with Blue Cruise. So those would be my top ones. What, 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 is, uh, what would be your ultimate build 
build configuration. If you were to go out and buy a 25, what? how would you option? I already it? got it figured out. So we got 25, four-wheel drive, ST, uh, with the moonroof, uh, and rapid red, I think is what I'd do. That's black it. painted roof as well. I don't know if we have, yeah, this one right here behind me with the black painted roof. Really visually lowers that center of gravity for the for the vehicle. So and you know, we see it. that a lot on the six gens and, and even ST owners. They'll go and, and black out the roof with mm -hmm. either the vinyl or, or uh, paint. And so Ford's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ford saw that and was like, hey, why don't we just go ahead and offer that from the factory? Right? Exactly, right. It's part of that, that customer listening experience, right? Through research and things like that. What are customers doing even in the aftermarket and, and bringing that implant to give them exactly what they want. And you also streamlined quite a bit of the option availability mm -hmm. and, and simplified. And, and I know the word simplified probably sounds <laughs> negative in a marketing standpoint, yeah. but you really did kind of simplify how these models are optioned and, and built. Yeah. What was kind of the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so it's uh, a couple of reasons. From a customer standpoint, it's it's uh, sometimes overwhelming the amount of things that they need to click through, right? If you went on the build and price website in 22 model year, it's probably 12, 13, 14 clicks to figure out exactly what you're getting. And uh, for the most part, we look at those buildable combinations. 10% of the builds is 90% of the volume that we're doing. So that was an opportunity for us to standardize a lot of that content and, and streamline the process choice for customers. But from a industrialization standpoint, there's, there's benefits to production as well, right? We're ordering one wiring harness instead of 14. We're ordering, uh, whatever, name a component, but there's, there's cost benefits of doing that. There's uh, quality benefits of doing that, right? So the plant's just building these, these certain configurations and that's leading to better quality. Excellent. Well, uh, on, on a final note, you know, with the uh, Explorer production starting to ramp back up in Chicago with the 25 model year, what's the kind of goal production number that you're, you're shooting for? Or do you know those, those? Yeah, not off the top of my head. We will build the demand though. So order banks are open. We're starting to ship those now. So they should be arriving on dealer lots here momentarily. All right. Well, hey man, thank you so much for spending time and bringing us out here. We're out here actually uh, driving the ST uh, pretty hard actually. <laughs> you probably hear a little bit of it in the background, but this is a blast and uh, definitely going to be going on another run. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you. And right now I'm here with uh, Matthew Dunfield. Why don't you tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do for uh, Ford? For sure. So I am the Ford brand marketing manager. So my responsibility is to make sure that the story of Explorer gets communicated as clearly and as broadly as we can. So what kind of research went into developing what you talk about the story of Explorer? So what, what, you know, what kind of research do you do? Do you have t people underneath you that just pull things and, hey, we think this would be cool to talk about? Like, explain that a little bit more. Absolutely. We do research in many different ways at many different points. So we're always in touch with our customers. The first thing that we do is we actually go out, we talk to our customers in person, in interviews, and then we actually go sit in their homes, in their living rooms. We understand how they use their vehicles, what they want out of their vehicles, but even more than that, really their hopes and dreams for their lives. So that we can build and craft the new vehicle in the new 25 model year to fit that exactly. And then along the way we have surveys, we listen to the social media posts, the forums, the online feedback so we're constantly iterating that vehicle to be as good as it can be. How far in advance do you usually start doing that when you know okay we're coming out with a new Model X right mm -hmm. and we're gonna start how what's that time frame like? It's it's time frame of years yeah. and I can tell you now we've already started talking and thinking about out in the 30 model year so we work incredibly far in advance but at the same time we don't just look at it five years in advance and then just go blindly constantly iterating at many different points. Now, uh, are, you're over the Explorer or you're over all of Ford marketing? I'm Explorer dedicated. Okay, Explorer which makes dedicated. It, yeah, which makes it more fun because I can really get in touch with who our customers are and what they want and be very laser focused on that. How much integration do, do you do personally with other products within Ford? You know, I know you say you were just Explorer, but I'm sure Ford has more of an umbrella vision for all of their models. So how much uh, talking do you do with other product managers like for F-150, Mustang, Bronco, you know, the, et cetera? Quite a bit. Every week we have a regular touch point so that we're looking at things in the same way. For example, our BNO audio, right? We want that to be a consistent strategy across Explorer, Expedition, F-150, Mustang, so on and so forth, so that it all ties together. So you buy any Ford vehicle and you say, ah, BNO is here. Ah, Ford Digital Experience is executed this way here, and it all makes sense. What, what was the reasoning for introducing Digital Experience to Explorer? 
the Ford Digital Experience really is the perfect execution for our customers to take what is a very busy, hectic, technological life, be it in your smartphone, your home assistant, your smart TV, and seamlessly tie that into your vehicle with a Google-based system, right? You're logging into your Google account, and now all of it flows, the App Store. It's right there in your vehicle. Excellent, and so was it the Explore just the good timing with the 25 to introduce it into the market? Yeah, the timing was good, but I'll say even more than that, the 25 model year Explorer really is a complete reimagination of that ex driver passenger experience from the interior to the tech to the Blue Cruise. All of that is to make Explorer a more driver centric, almost driver focused experience. So the tech followed. Excellent. What would be your favorite part of the new 2025 Explorer? Personally, you can't get over excited about ST. I love ST, but when you get into it, I think the new interior really makes you just sit back and say, wow, right? All the soft touch materials, in fact, everything you can reach out and touch as you drive has been intentionally designed, be it the textures, the colors, the materials, the soft touch, anything you can touch, we have thought about. If you had one, whatever build configuration would be, would be any modifications that you would personally make to it? That's a, actually a great question. So what I would get is I would get an ST line premium package four wheel drive. I would probably add the street package because I love the darker wheels, the bigger wheels. Those are exciting to me. And if I get a little wild, I'd probably put a lift on it. A lift, yes. nice. Yes. I like that on an ST. Yes. Excellent. Well, one last question. I know you, you can't talk about future, sure. right? Is there any hints you could give us about what's coming down the line for this iteration Explorer? Sure. I mean, we've done a little bit of teasing there around the off-road space, and I will say we listen very closely to our Timberline customers. They use these vehicles, and our goal is to bring them something from an off-road standpoint that's going to, I think, make everybody really happy. So I can't tell you what it is, but in the coming future, we'll have something to say about off-road. Excellent. Matthew, thank you so much for not only thank being you. out here and talking with us, but also inviting Explorer Forum out here to, I mean, the mecca of Detroit and Explorer them. So thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. We love having you guys. Thank so thanks you. for coming. All right, so a lot of people that know me know that I love the Explorer. I do love the Explorer. I've been driving an Explorer since I was a little one. That was a vehicle I took my first driving test at. The Explorer means a lot to me. And since they have been doing so much to keep the Explorer alive, and this vehicle is basically embodying what the Explorer really is. It's basically a vehicle that means freedom. Going places with friends, family, doing road trips. Yeah, it's somewhat of a light off-roader, but it gets you what you want. It gets the American freedom. And that's what I like about the Explorer. And even to this day, I still drive some first generation Explorers, but you know what? You know, you still have to have new models coming out. And this Explorer is basically reaching the customer base that the first Explorer did beat in the first place, so. Hey guys, I want to thank Ford Motor Company and ExplorerForum.com for allowing us to come out here and do this first drive on the 25 Explorer. We have tried so hard to make sure that we are being the voice of the Explorer Forum and of the fans of the Explorer. So if there's things that you do not like about the new Explorer, please let us know so we can help relay that information so they can help build the next Explorer. We would not be here if it wasn't for the Explorer form and the fan base makes it possible. So let's continue to drive and enjoy the Explorer so future generations can enjoy it as well.